race this year. Uh, I do want to mention that you're not the youngest person in the field. One of our friends here in the audience is awesome. 20 and is going to be running the, the Hell race. Yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> Hey guys, I am back. Uh, before I start, I have something I want to show you. In this little box, I have a bronze buckle. So that's pretty cool. And uh, it's been a while since Western States, and I just kind of wanted to go over what happened on that day, uh, how everything went down. Sorry, it's been so late. The reason for that is just that in the week after, I was just so beat up and I didn't really feel like diving into it. Um, I actually started to write a blog post about three days after and I was just making so many typos and was so tired that I was like, okay, I have to prolong it a couple couple more days. And then eventually I did write a blog post. So if you wanna read rather than, than listen and watch, um, feel free to, to read that. I pretty much dove into all the details, but just kind of wanted to talk about how the day happened and I have some good footage to lay into that as well. We got up there on Wednesday and we went to the I Run Far live interviews, which was really cool. Um, got to meet some really cool folks, talked to Dylan Bowman for a while. Saw Megan Hicks, Brian Powell, um, a couple of you folks up there that said hi and I'm grateful for that. Um, that was really nice. And uh, Saturday morning, the gun went off, myself and most of my crew probably had not had a whole lot of sleep, but uh, yeah, started the race and the first 10 miles went to Lions Ridge. So it was a long section, but it was early in the race and I just kept it easy, hiked most of the way up to the top of the escarpment and uh, that went really well. I um, was feeling good at mile 10, like I could go for a long time. Mile 15 uh, to Red Star Ridge felt, uh, it was getting a little bit more difficult. The sun was coming up and it was getting a bit warmer. Um, and then between 15 and 24, which is where Duncan Canyon Aid Station is, was when I really started to, uh, I started to feel a little bit tired and my, my feet were kind of hurting a little bit. And I was thinking, man, this, this might be a long day. But uh, once I got to mile 24, I saw my crew and felt really good. And actually Ann Trayson put ice in my arm sleeves and she was helping me out. and. And having Ann Trace and helping me for some reason just gave me a big boost. I mean, she's a total legend. Um, that's super random, but I don't know. I just thought that was funny. So uh, from there, went to Robinson Flat. Robinson Flat was feeling pretty tired. It was pretty hot. Um, and then after Robinson Flat, you've got about a half marathon of mostly downhill. And the first eight miles of that half marathon, I crushed. Um, I Things turned around for me. I started feeling really good. Um, and then the last five miles of that down to Last Chance Aid Station, um, I was like, oh man, uh, I do not feel good. So the section between Duncan Canyon, which is mile 38, and Last Chance, which is mile 43, um, man, I, I felt terrible. And, and that's when it started to hit me, like I am not prepared for this race. And frankly, I wasn't prepared for that race because of the injuries I'd had. Um, some Achilles problems and, and stuff. I hadn't been able to do very good training and I just hoped that what I had would be enough to get me to the finish line. I knew that it wasn't gonna be enough to get me to the finish line super quickly, but I hoped that it would be enough to get me there. But uh, yeah, around mile 43 was when it started to sink in that I was not prepared for that much downhill running. My quads were hurting, um, I was exhausted. Yeah, got to last chance, sat down, a uh, nice older lady was helping me out and um, and this is where I was, the first part that I was really down on myself and one of the things that sort of got me out of that point was this guy ran by me and, and he was like, how are you doing? And I was like, oh man, not doing well. Um, and he said something along the lines of, keep going man, it's too damn hard to get into this race. And I was like, yeah, I, I don't wanna drop, that would be, that would be a disappointment for sure. Another piece of motivation that was pretty big for me is everyone had these signs, like these these like picket signs. I don't know who made them for people and I didn't have one, but I was reading other people's and some of them said things like, you know, after six years, you finally got in, let, let's do this and stuff like that. And 
and I was just thinking like, man, I have been so lucky having gotten in on one ticket and um, there were folks on the wait list I knew that that really wanted to get in and um, and I didn't want to drop because I was unprepared. That would have really hurt and I would have felt bad. And I knew that I had an amazing opportunity to run Western States and that not a lot of people get. And I knew that I had to keep going, at least I had to try. Um, and if I had to walk forever and eventually get pulled off for cutoffs, then that was what it was gonna have to be. But I kept going and uh, got to Devil's Thumb. The climb up Devil's Thumb was ridiculous. Uh, one of the steepest hills I've ever done. It was 1,800 feet of vertical gain in 1.8 miles, so 1,000 feet a mile. Um, that was insane, but for some reason going up Devil's Thumb, I passed a bunch of people, like maybe 10 people. Um, I don't know why that happened. I didn't feel like I was hiking that fast, but uh, I guess everyone was hurting. So I passed about 10 people going up. And then uh, after that, you go down to El Dorado Canyon right before you climb up to Michigan Bluff and uh, was able to run a little bit. And then once again, the wheels fell off about a mile before El Dorado. And I walked down to El Dorado and my quads were just in intense pain and uh, got to the bottom and it was just like, oh man, I I don't I didn't think that I had I had it in me to go another 50 miles. At that point, it was mile 52, so I would have had to go another 48. And I was positive that my legs, my quads were were just done. That I wasn't prepared enough, and that I wasn't going to be able to go much further. Um, and there was a guy sitting next to me, and he was having trouble. He was having stomach problems, and he had decided to drop at Michigan Bluff, um, which was the next aid station. And yeah, and I decided at that point that I was gonna hike up to Michigan Bluff um, as, as well as I could and drop out and that my legs were just too beat up and I wasn't prepared. Started hiking up Michigan Bluff at like one mile an hour. I was moving so slow. Um, it was a steep climb, but I wasn't moving well. And then uh, started to, to be able to walk a little bit better um, and walk a little bit better and you know it's important for me to talk about the motivation here that that kept me kept me going and not decide made me decide not to drop out at at Michigan Bluff and the main thing there was just thinking about my crew and all the people that had had talked to me and, and helped me and supported me and I thought about you know when I got up to Michigan Bluff I was gonna have to make a phone call to to my crew that was at Forest Hill and, and my pacer who was gonna pick me up at the river and just be like, hey guys, I know you've, you've supported me this whole time and you know spent a lot of time and, and energy on this and um, it's just not gonna happen today. And, and when I thought about making that phone call, it just broke my heart kinda and, and I was like, man, maybe I can just walk a little bit and just walk through it. Just keep walking until they, they pull me off. Like, I really don't want to let these people down. Um, yeah, it was it was tough. But Michigan Bluff kind of leveled out a little bit and I started walking and I looked at my watch and it was around 18 minute pace was what I was walking. And I knew that 18 minute pace was 30 hour pace. And I thought, you know, with all the time I've banked in the last 50 miles from running, if I can just keep walking, like I should be able to get there under the cutoff. Um, so walked into Michigan Bluff with my mind changed. I was ready to go. Uh, some nice folks there that that had no, that knew me from here, and I'm sure are watching this. Um, it was really nice to see you guys up there and uh, uh, and chat with you guys for a minute. Yes. Oh, what was it? Yes. No, that's awesome. That's Thank awesome. you. And we got to share that moment with Mitch. Get out. <laughs> that's amazing. I'm Get so out. Thank you so much. Hey, so proud of you. Keep up. And so I took out off out of Michigan Bluff. I thought I was walking for the rest of the race. And yeah, I, I don't know what what happened here, but at some point I just started running. Um, it hurt like terribly to start. Like the first few steps are excruciating. But at some point I just kinda just went for it and, and got into a jog and I discovered that I could run the flats um, slowly and I could run gentle downhills. The gentle downhills were like the best thing for me. What I couldn't do was like the steeper downhills, like any anything in those canyons was like just 
agony. Any anything steep where I had to like lean back and break was just terrible quad pain. Um, so, uh, yeah. So through Volcano Canyon into Forest Hill. Um, Forest Hill, I saw it was dark. I saw my my entire crew there, and that was a big um, lifted my spirits a lot. And I picked up my first pacer there. And uh, going out of Forest Hill, I felt great, and I pretty much ran the entire section to Cal One. Yeah! We're almost there. Almost over. <laughs> so we got right. we got 3.7 miles until Cal One. Yeah. So it's and it's downhill. Yeah. So yeah, like I can, I just I can run smooth and easy. Uh, downhills and I can run the okay. flats but I can't like, yeah. I can't do the canyons okay like the super like steep drops yeah okay. I just have to walk down okay down. that's cool section it was downhill in fact I think it might have run a little bit you know it was like 11 or 12 minute pace so it wasn't fast but I think I might have gone a little too hard all considering because after that I was kind of spent and uh, I kind of mixed it up between walking and running for the rest of the the Cal Street section down to the river so I was kind of walking and running Rolling into the next aid station here. That's how it's tripping. Dang, it's too far away. Wheat Feet Sport to Sacramento. Woo! Uh, how far is the next one? Five miles. Okay, uh, I'll take. And when I got to the river, saw my crew again, and that was great. And uh, crossing the American River was just awesome because that was somewhere that I'd been spectating the last couple of years, and. And it's just, to, to actually do it myself was just, yeah, it almost makes me like emotional to talk about. Like to do it myself was was just an amazing experience to grab onto the rope and, and go through with my pacer. That was amazing. And uh, I mean, I was so tired, but just kept moving. And at this point, I, I thought we had plenty of, plenty of time on cutoff. So um, I was gonna try and get the finish and, and uh, kept going. Um, so got to mile 79.8, which was Green Gate, and uh, spent a minute there and then kept going. Um, I, at this point, I started to have this pain in my foot, like my, my, the arch on my right side was collapsing and it was getting really painful. And, uh, and actually, I think now I um, have a bit of a stress fracture in, in one, of my, one of my metatarsals on that foot. So my foot was starting to hurt, and between Green Gate, mile 80, and... Auburn Lakes Trail, mile 85, 
uh, I had to stop a bunch of times to like massage my foot. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was really slowing me down. Um, but I got to Auburn Lakes Trail and I, I thought if I got to Auburn Lake Trails, um, that I was going to make it to the finish. Uh, I don't know. It's just like 15 miles left. So my pacer and I got there. We took off to the next one, which was the Quarry Road Aid Station. It was like 5.6 miles. And at that point in the race, I was moving slow enough that 5.6 miles felt like forever. But my pacer and I had this weird strategy to, uh, to make the time pass. And what we were actually doing is doing mile repeats. So we did four mile repeats on the way to the Quarry Road Aid Station. And, and the main thing here is my foot was killing me. Like I was in so much pain, but I was, I was just kind of gutting it out. And uh, yeah, so my pacer would look at his watch. My watch was dead at this point. Um, he'd look at his watch and, and he'd, he'd count off a mile. We'd run a mile and then we'd walk for a quarter mile, like slowly. Um, and doing that, I think actually, like, I think we moved fairly well. Um, I mean, I was only running like 11 or 12 minute miles at that point, but um, running four miles of the five and a half mile section was like pretty good. Um, we, we made good time. I don't know what happened after that because my I started to get this swelling in my ankle. My ankle had swollen up. Um, yeah, not sure why. I think it might have had something to do with the modifications I made to one of my other shoes where I, I cut the heel out of the back and my foot might have been sliding a little bit in the shoe. Um, not sure if that's the reason. That's just, uh, it's just a thought, but, uh, I had to hike pretty much all the way from, from, uh, quarry road at mile 90.7, I think to, um, uh, pointed rocks mile 94.6. Um, but at this point, like I knew I had enough time to just, to just walk and, and get there. And by the time I got to, pointed rocks like everything was so swollen it was in so much pain um and I was just limping uh and I got there and I sat down and uh someone from medical came over and and he taped up my ankle and he gave me two ibuprofen and two acetaminophen which I wouldn't have done in the middle of the race because that seems like a lot um I knew I was going to get to the finish but I was kind of like oh, man I don't want it to take like three hours to go the last six miles um but uh, yeah, so anyway, he taped it up, started feeling a little better, ran a little bit of the way down to No Hands Bridge. Crossing No Hands Bridge, once again, is just like the most unbelievable thing. I mean, it's that, that's like, that's an iconic image and to be able to do that was cool. So at that point, it was kind of just a victory lap. Just walked through and then up to Roby Point, which is a bit of a climb. Yeah, yeah when you get out. into the city of Auburn. Yeah, um, there's all these people in their driveways and my like part of my crew met me up there and walked it in with me and um, Yeah, go walking through Auburn was one of the most memorable parts of the race even though it was after 28 hours of running and I was exhausted, but um, Yeah, it, it was just amazing and uh, got down to the track and got to hear John Medinger uh, Say my name and and my occupation, which is just like student <laughs> Um, and that was cool. Yeah, and I got to the finish and I got a buckle. And I think the biggest takeaways from the race is that um, in a 100 miler, things don't always get worse. Like there were so many times where I was like, there's no way I'm gonna be able to go another 50 miles. And then things just kind of turned around and I started to feel better. And I've never done anything that difficult in my entire life. And and for sure I would have dropped if, if not for my crew and uh, my pacers and all you guys on YouTube that have um, offered me good wishes. And uh, I'm just glad that I got a buckle. <laughs> I know I, I said I wanted a silver buckle and it's not silver, but man, getting to the finish line was like the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And yeah, it was awesome. And there's so many people out on the course that just are so enthusiastic and so nice. If you want your faith in humanity restored, go to Western States and the city of Auburn, which just, absolutely loves the race um yeah it's awesome thanks for listening and uh stay tuned i uh, don't know what's happening in my schedule for a little while but i will figure it out so thanks yeah